Good afternoon and good morning to our uh, colleagues in a different time zone. Welcome back to our workshop on personal protective equipment and personal protective technology and how we can build a more resilient public health supply chain. For those of you who are just joining us, I'm Tanner Venema and I'm a senior scientist in the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. Welcome to our session on approaches to prioritizing standards and gap filling. I'm very excited about this section of the workshop because we have an amazing group of panelists who will be joining today in a roundtable discussion that will help bring our workshop full circle from reflecting back and identifying gaps in standards and the standardization process, problems with products, populations that really need more attention for us to be able to ensure their protection, to really looking at how are we going to prioritize the work that needs to be done going forward. And I'm going to ask, how are we going to drive these actions into real change. So we have quite the charge ahead of us with this panel. But before I begin, I wanna take a few moments and reflect on some of the things that we've learned and heard through the workshop at this point. First of all, as a member of the planning committee, I know that all of us who have worked on this committee have been absolutely touched by the compelling and disheartening information and testimony that so many of our subject magic matter experts have provided to us. We have heard challenges and stories out of the COVID-19 pandemic, recognizing the people that we were not able to adequately protect and the implications of this virus on those healthcare workers, those critical essential workers and members of the public who are our families and our friends. I feel so personally compelled to continue this work. And I'm deeply honored by the entire collection of participants in this workshop, whose dedicated research and practice, policymaking and administrative roles continue to work with NIOSH and NPPTL to drive improvements in worker protection going forward. So on that note, let's take a couple of moments and to think about some of the gaps that were pointed out in the task force report, such as multiple gaps in the conformity assessment criteria and procedures across almost all categories of PPE with possibly the exception of respirators. We identified gaps in the fit for respirators, gloves, gowns, for the diversity of the workforce, for the public, for children. We identified gaps in looking at the interface of different types of personal protective equipment in order to evaluate how effective they are when they are put together. We know we have no standard for measuring the effectiveness of source control for respiratory protection and that we have a lack of guidance for the selection, the use, the care of personal protective equipment, which really includes cleaning, disinfection, decontamination, storage, and reuse. Yesterday, we heard from many of our experts who really called out an incredible need to improve collaboration across actors in establishing and communicating standards in order to move us towards building a more resilient supply chain that will be critical to future success in response efforts. We heard a need to harmonize standards, both in the US and on the international stage in order to contribute to better design, rapid scale up of manufacturing in the face of an emergency, and to build confidence in the products that we are distributing and recommending to the workforce and to the public. We identified significant gaps in the design of personal protective equipment for a range of users and body types and shapes and sizes. 
we heard from a wonderful speaker at the Ross Rochester Institute on Technology who spoke to the 26 million Americans who have some type of disability or challenge, and we need to be able to address that. We recognize that 31% of the US population are children, and we have failed in our capacity to ensure their safety and protection. We heard on behalf of farm workers, EMS responders, LPNs in long-term care facilities, meat packing plant workers. We have such a diverse variety of populations that deserve better from us going forward. We know that we need to, our goal is to bring properly approved products to the marketplace for all users and that designers and our manufacturers will benefit from anthropomorphic data that is accurate and inclusive in order to build these products. Today, I wanna to highlight some of the themes that we've heard in terms that this challenge is not exclusively gaps in standards, but in the amazing complexity of the standards that we have for manufacturers, distributors, purchasers, and our end users. How, how do we form the standards has a direct impact on the supply chain itself on how it's structured and how it's functioned. And we need to think about that. There are so many standards and situations that we've realized this can be mind boggling and overwhelming when we take it all in. Can we simplify? Can we strip away some of this complexity to make this process much cleaner, much clearer, and much more productive going forward? We know that we need to center equity more intentionally in regulation and in education about PPE. We've had much discussion today about PPE in healthcare settings where there are respiratory protection programs and other safety engineering programs and standards. But we recognize that there is much weaker regulation in other occupational settings. Finally, we've identified that products for general public use need to be simplified, need to be intuitive, need to be designed for a wide range of users, and that we need to do a better job of communicating to the public why it's important, which product to use, when to use it, and how to use it. We have an interesting panel of discussions joining us today. We, as I said, are not going to have presentations like we have in previous sessions, but we're going to host this as an open roundtable discussion. I'll be introducing our panelists and kicking off with a few questions, but then it will be open for anyone to join in as they feel likely to do. It's my great pleasure to introduce our discussants today. Professor Oslem Ergen from Northeastern University, Professor Lisa Rousseau from the University of Illinois in Chicago, Andy Moyle of Agle, Bonnie Rogers from Stone Turn, Stone Turn Consultants, who was a member of the task force that examined the gap in standards that we have been discussing. Professor Sundarizan Jarayaraman of Georgia Tech, who is also a member of the task force, and Mark Shirley of Sutter Health also a task force member. Thank you all and welcome to you. I'm so grateful for you sharing your time during our panel. For any of our attendees, if you would like more information about our panelists, a link to their bios has been posted on the event website. And as in all of our previous uh, session, sections, members of the public and our attendees are welcome to post questions for us and for our discussants, um, please put them in the Q&A section below the video player. So let me start off with our first question. We have heard so many gaps throughout this workshop. What criteria or approach should we consider in order to prioritize the gaps and to guide our actions moving forward? 
And I'm going to call on uh, Lisa to speak first and then ask her to turn it to Cindy Reason. Thank you and welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Um, well, you ask a good question. You know, I was struck throughout the workshop and I did attend all of it that, um, you know, a lot of the issues about uh, PPE in general that were raised are the same ones we've heard throughout uh, my career with respect to respirators. Uh, you know, we want something more comfortable. We want it to be easier to wear. We want to know that it works. We want it to fit everyone you know, on and on. Um, I think we have to, to be able to prioritize, we have to think about who, who is, who are our users? How many of them are there? And what are their, you know, what are their immediate needs? And I'm beginning to be struck by the fact that we, we really, beyond just thinking about a respirator for the public, we need to think, be thinking about, and I always talk about respirators, but you can put PPE in this category in general, um, PPE that can be used by anyone in any situation. So, you know, a more holistic view of PPE, understanding it's a complex topic and that there are many features. But um, if we start having a conversation about this universal picture, um, then we can think about what is a universal standard? What, what do we expect from a standard in general? Um, I don't even know if there's a standard for PPE standards. <laughs> um, I went back and looked at, um, you know, OSHA's got some, some guidance about PPE in general, and it, it outlines what, you know, some criteria for what we expect from personal protective equipment uh, that, would be a good start, but there, is, you know, there's so much more to it. Um, I guess the other piece of the puzzle I would suggest is, you know, we really have to look hard at what, uh, or ask manufacturers, what are they being asked to provide? Because they will tell us, what is the public looking for? What do, what do people need and want? And then are they able to meet those criteria? What's missing from what they can do or can't do in terms of, of a, a standard or production or communication or whatever? Uh, so it's our user community and our, and our manufacturers who are really the key to understanding what, what has to happen first. Thank you so much, Lisa. Certainly a standard for standards that would help answer that question and streamline some of that complexity would be such a benefit. Sundarizan, can I turn it to you? Sure. Uh, thank you, Tenor. It's nice to be uh, participating in the session. And uh, Lisa nicely laid out the foundation. You know, we're all in search of the Holy Grail. Uh, and to me, if we think about it, RJ11 and RJ45, you know, the telephone jack and the internet jack, you know, that's a universal standard regardless of where you go. So my dream is one day we will have that kind of interoperable standards for uh, PPE. The question is, how do we get there? Okay, so Ashley, if you could uh, kindly put the slides. I put together three or four slides to kind of walk us through, you know, how we might prioritize this. Uh, uh, go to the next slide, please. Yeah. Um, so the sessions, as Lisa said, and uh, Tanner started us off, the sessions have been absolutely outstanding. And the key message that I got from all the sessions and also having participated in the POEM uh, task force is uh, standards impact all the stakeholders in the supply chain. And more importantly, all the stakeholders will benefit from standards, you know, whether it's your designers, your manufacturers, your people responsible for stockpiling, to end users. So that means standards are very, very critical. The other key message I got out uh, during the last day and a half is they're required, if you want, the whole idea here is to create a resilient and trustworthy PPE supply chain that we know is very complex, but it needs to be agile. And I need to deliver customized responses to a diverse population using processes, technologies, and people. So given that frame, that foundation, the next step is, you know, where do we go from here? You know, do I develop standards for people? Do I develop standards for firefighters? So I need some kind of a framework so that I can start prioritizing the development of standards. So in thinking about it, I said, you know, structurally, if I think about it, um, you know, first and foremost, I want to look at, you know, where is the maximum impact of a particular standard? Let's say we develop standards for 
uh, PPE, uh, 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 respiratory protective device for public, is that going to have the maximum impact? Or an interface between a glove and the jacket for a firefighter, is that going to have an impact? So we need to have that those kinds of metrics. The second one is how easy it is for me to create a standard. And finally, and more importantly, and this is just a subset, is, you know, is there somebody who can champion the uh, development of the standard? Is NPPTL going to take the lead or somebody else going to take the lead? <coughs> then, uh, as Lisa said, you know, we want to have uh, PPE like public or do we look at interfaces? So that's another way to uh, kind of uh, look at this uh, prioritization is, do I go PPE by PPE? Or I also have another initiative by looking at attributes that are cross-cutting, you know, human factors, you know, diversity of users. That is something we heard uh, again and again uh, during the last day and a half reusability, decontamination. So he, that's kind of a way, a first step towards thinking about having a structured way to prioritize and develop standards. So Ashley, if you could go to the next slide, please. So in thinking about it, uh, this is what I try to do here. So uh, on the left axis, what I showed in the first column is uh, uh, standards by PPE, you know, a respiratory protective device for the public, for the children. And then in the bottom, I put together a set of factors that are cross-cutting across all the uh, PPE. Then I started looking at, okay, uh, expected impact of the standard. In other words, if I develop the standard, how many people are going to be impacted by that positively? And what, what is going to be the economic benefit by having a standard? And I said, okay, think in terms of high, medium, and low. The second one is ease of realization. You know, how easy it is for me to create these standards. Uh, we all know the development of standards is highly complex, you know, um, and, and so the question is, how complex is the task? Again, can I put it in high, medium, and low? Then how much time do I require? What resources are required? Uh, funding, time, expertise, and then finally, you know, who is going to champion the development of the uh, standard? So kind of this is like a starting framework for us to think in terms of you know, taking a structured approach to it as opposed to an emotional approach. You know, emotion is very important. That was, uh, that was very obvious during all the presentations. In other words, we have a crisis. We need to address it. And this is a good foundation, I believe, a starting point for looking at prioritizing. So if you go to the next slide, um, and so this is what I want us to be able to do. Our ultimate objective is to develop a, a thriving, a resilient, and a trustworthy supply chain for PPE. And, it, and this is the dream I have, you know, uh, Linda started us off by saying um, every, you know, every life is precious and, uh, and to me, standards impact every life. So that is the foundation on which we need to start thinking in terms of creating this uh, uh, resilient supply chain. And I look at the pillars. I mean, these are all the stakeholders. And I uh, try to say, you know, what is it? At the end of the day, when COVID-19 happened, I was stuck. I didn't know what to use, even though I'm supposed to be working in this domain. And I had so many calls. So users need guidance and we can go across each pillar. Manufacturers need guidance so that their product will conform to standards. Employers need to know, you know, what do I give to this worker who is going to be exposed to this inhalation hazard? You know, what's happening in East Palestine, for instance, okay? The government needs guidance on stockpiling, uh, how long to store it, where to store it, how to distribute it. Standards organizations, you know, where do they get the expertise to keep the standards living. Uh, one of the things I heard in the last day and a half is, um, you know, standards cannot be static, they need to move forward. And then of course, certification organizations. So if we do all that, then our ultimate goal will be to supply the right PP of the right performance, in the right quality, in the right quantity, or what I call the five R's. And this is what I use in my teaching. Uh, these five R's, that's the whole idea behind a supply chain. So my dream is that we'll have an R11 slash, uh, RJ45 for PPE. So this is one approach, a starting point for a discussion in terms of developing uh, priorities for standardization. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sundarisen. And I'm very interested to hear the other panelists and their observations regarding what Sundarisen has presented. Awesome. Yeah, just a quick comment, and I, I did not have the privilege to join the panels uh, throughout the day, yesterday and today, but uh, just one thing, if the goal is supply chain resilience and a supply chain that works well with the five R's, uh, I would also suggest really, really doing the analysis of 
how each developed standard is impacting the supply chain resilience measures that we think about, right? And because, for example, inventory, right? Inventory, keeping inventory or stockpiling is a, is a resilience measure, as well as flexible manufacturing practices and ramping up and ramping down quickly is a resilience measure. So if a standard is developed in a certain way, it might, it might affect keeping more stockpile, like a higher stockpile in a positive way, but might make a manufacturing process less flexible, right? So we have to, I think, again, these are complex systems and we have to make a system-wide assessment of what it means for different types of supply chain resilience measures when we develop a standard. That's an excellent um, point, Aslam. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think about, of course, we know we're we're preparing for the next pandemic, right? Looming on the horizon. Concerns over the ambiguity and uncertainty of what that pathogen will bring. And will it be worse in terms of transmissibility, the R not, the pathogenicity? So how can we build that framework? with standards so that it's nimble enough that we can react to that next pathogen. Bonnie? Uh, yeah, so, you know, I, I've given this a lot of thought and I, I think when Lisa was talking about having a, a standard for the standards <laughs> would certainly be helpful. Um, our team reviewed, I wanna say more than a hundred standards on PPE and, uh, you know, there, it was difficult to say the least. And then we also interviewed um, dozens of stakeholders. And when Mark was talking earlier offline about the end user, that was really important. That's such important information. And looking at the information in terms of the background information that I read, um, I think it was a, particularly in that 21st century document, you know, they talk about decision makers but mostly refer to experts. And the decisions of end users needs to be there. What that means is that the end users need to be at the table when these discussions are happening. It's not just the experts. So when we look at, at particularly when I look at the data that, that we have collected, you know, this, there's just scores of, uh, and, I, and I know you've had this in terms of looking at gaps as well, but the pain and discomfort that people have uh, while wearing, particularly while wearing respirators, but also when you're looking at gowns and gloves and such, um, those particular medical devices don't always work. They tear, they get holes, so people are exposed. Um, you know, healthcare providers, particularly during COVID, the availability was not there, which we all know. Um, but looking at the different, the different settings is so critical. A lot of the research that gets done clearly is done in hospitals. We all know that. It's not done necessarily in long-term care or home health. And, and let me just give you a really good example. So talking to frontline workers in home health researchers and also I talked to a couple of interviewed a couple of people who were the owners of these agencies. Um, fit testing, they didn't even know what that was to begin mm -hmm. with. It wasn't even on their on their radar, fit testing. Then when they did do fit testing um, several months later, uh, they might do it at at the um, trunk of the car with the healthcare provider or at the bus stop of where the healthcare provider gets off the bus, meets the supervisor, it's raining, it's snowing, whatever. Yeah. You know, so taking into consideration all these factors becomes very, very important. And one of the things that was pointed out, and this was pointed out to me when I was interviewing nurses who worked in ORs, is that there's a significant psychological discomfort that goes on with wearing a respirator, being all garbed up and they can't really speak to patients and patients can't hear them. So there's all of these other factors that go in to conformity assessment. You may not think so, but it really is because when you develop a respirator or any other type of equipment, that has to take into, into the context that 
in a nursing home, in home health, the patients are old. You know, and they may have hearing problems. Right. They often will try to read your lips, but you've got that respirator on and they can't. So then what happens? The healthcare worker takes the respirator off. Mm. That's what happens in the real world. So all of that needs to be addressed. And just to, to finish up, because I know, that, you know other people want to speak, uh, I made a little list here. Um, it's important to have a strategy to know, and I think Lisa mentioned this as well, and Sundarisa always has wonderful ideas. I can't always wait for seeing your models. I love those. <laughs> um, but looking at a strategy to collect data from the end users, but collecting those data cannot be burdensome or they won't be collected properly. That, that's just a bottom line. That's, that just happens. Um, best practices need to be identified in all settings, not just hospital settings. And so home health people would say to me, you know, I listened to a webinar um, about PPE on something, but it was all hospital. It had nothing to do with the kind of work that I'm doing. So that's, that's another important thing. It's important that these federal agencies learn, and I mean learn, to collaborate, not compete. They need to learn to collaborate so that when they have overlap, What's the best agency to deal with the issue? And that may mean giving up something that you've been doing for a while. And that, I think that's really, really, really critical. And messaging, of course, is an important piece. And I think uh, when Sind recent had up there the issue of having a champion for standards, mm -hmm. in the end user environment, you also need to have respiratory protection, PPE protection champions. These are people that you can go to that are knowledgeable, but who work on those units, who are actually involved in the clinical care because the care is so different. Every scenario is different. It's not one size fits all. So thinking about the issues related to conformity assessment and the types of PPE that are available, it's not going to be the same for everybody. And that has to be taken into consideration. So I'm gonna just end there because, although I do have so much more I can say. <laughs> Thank you. So Thank much. you, Bonnie. That's uh, absolutely the importance of looking at the diversity of clinical yeah. settings and community based settings where people were using PPE and the diverse group of workers who were using it that focus on that end user. I want to uh, even probe that a little further because I, I again, I'm going back to the national strategy. Uh, for a resilient public health supply chain. And under one of uh, goal three, um, the, the strategy talks about although resilience is enabled by capacities and capabilities of our systems, it's the behavioral element of the actors within and across those systems that truly creates resiliency. And I think that's just what you're drilling down to. And I, I'd like to ask Mark, uh, to weigh in on this, because I know you've had such an incredible experience with this. Thank you. Um, before I do, I, I want to echo what Lisa and Cinder Rayson said. I think Lisa said standards on standards, and then Cinder Rayson said it's important that these standards be living. And I, I could come up with examples, but technology has advanced such that some of our standards now are outdated. Yeah. And so if we could um, prescribe a review date um, at a minimum, I mean, some of our standards are decades old. Um, I, I think that was excellent points by Lisa and Cinder Rayson. Um, I do want to touch on risk assessments and the importance of those. And um, this is, I believe, a really um, good lesson learned from, from COVID and would really help our supply chain chain strategy uh, or become more resilient when we have the next outbreak is um, efficient use of PPE. So understanding which activities are high risk. So uh, what procedures may generate aerosols and to what level of aerosols. There's a lot of differing information out there. At what point in uh, asymptomatic community spread do we put everybody in respirators when we're unsure of say somebody's COVID or whatever aerosol transmissible disease happens to be in play? 
um, at what level of asymptomatic community a positivity rate do we just say everybody needs to be in a respirator at this point in time? Um, so I think these risk assessments are um, critical and I think we can do them proactively. So the next time we have a disease that is um, spreading either by droplet or aerosol, or we're not sure how it's um, being transmitted, that we are better prepared to provide um, employers with good advice. And, and I would recommend, and I think all of us would agree, that um, leaning towards being the precautionary principle, so being conservative when we're uncertain. And that was certainly from my perspective as an environmental health and safety professional, was such a challenge in the first six months year with this pandemic as the guidance continued to change some of that was political. Some of it was we didn't know exactly what we were dealing with. We were learning by doing. Um, but I think there's a huge opportunity for us to proactively make assessments on disease transmission and generate some standards around um, the approach going forward for our next outbreak. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mark, for those thoughtful words. Andy, can I ask you to weigh in and share with us from the manufacturing perspective? Because without our manufacturers, we're not going to have products for that next pandemic. Yeah, um, it's a it's a it's a tough balance. Um, you know, we're, we Agley was one of the let's call it new N95 manufacturers that jumped into the you know post pandemic. Um, my knowledge of the overseas supply chain and. You know, I shared in my panel yesterday the, the lack of ability to verify overseas product and then issues with selling within the pre-existing channels um, cause a lot of problems. Um, you know, for example, you know, I'll just give anecdotal just so everyone can, this is more for learning for everybody not here to, you know, um, talk about all the problems that we went through, but I think it's important for us to be prepared for the next time. But, you know, for example, it takes two years of financial to get on GSA schedule. So as a new business, we couldn't sell to the government for a lot of different things. We applied to almost every CSO, um, talked to all the heads of different departments, lobbied everything for Buy America, Made in USA. There was a Buy American PPE Act. Uh, we, we received zero dollars in government, you know, funding or purchases. Um, you know, we had a state of art facility. We had 45,000 square feet of manufacturing. Um, we had capacity to make over 100 million masks. Um, and we sold probably 95% of our business, you know, to direct to consumer because we weren't able to get into health systems, PCOs, people that wanted American products, but, you know, they wanted the overseas Chinese pricing. 95% um, of PPEs made overseas. Um, because of my knowledge and working and helping Silicon Valley companies go over to China, I, I had direct relationship manufacturers. So that's one of the abilities for us to get up quickly. Um, we raised um, in July of 2020. And we had our first machines landed in October 2020. <clears throat> Due to the overwhelming amount of applications for NIOSH, it took almost six months to get our application. And that's when the vaccines came out. Um, pretty much left for dead, it had zero sales. Um, and, um, you know, if not for anti counterfeit technology, which um, a lot of people had fear of buying bad PPE, um, the Washington Post uh, did an organic. Uh, article that was thanks to uh, Ann Miller and the Project N95 folks, they helped us because they were huge advocates for selling proper PPE. Um, but you know everything was stacked against us. Facebook, Google blocked all N95 advertising um, on the analytics side. Um, so that meant anyone who was a bad actor selling M95, R95, or fake standards, fake FTC, they could advertise with impunity on, on uh, Google and Facebook. And you, I have data from Amazon and other free PL sites of those folks selling 20, 30, 40 million dollars worth of products uh, that were counterfeit and, and terrible. Um, and like I said, they were selling that to children. They were selling that to people that thought they were protecting themselves and their families. And it's a huge public health crisis when the folks that you know paid for the money went through the proper certification, did the proper testing, followed all the proper standards and guidelines that allow the folks on this call. And we weren't rewarded. We were actually punished for that because we weren't able to advertise on Google or Facebook. We weren't able to do, we we're pretty much just handcuffed. Um, you know, I pretty much know outside of the large, you know, the big three, I, I know pretty much all the CEOs in America. 
And I'd say 80-90% of them have either stopped producing or out of business. Um, we're in the process of liquidation ourselves. Um, and so, you know, we, we really didn't get any favors or any help from any but uh, industrial healthcare buyers groups um, required, you know, again, certain financials, certain amount of time in business. And so it didn't lend for us to get into the traditional supply chains. And, um, you know, there was a, there was a uh, warm basing preservation government contract that was designed for this, um, um, this, this kind of situation to help, you know, warm, the warm basing is to keep manufacturers minimally viable for the next pandemic. Uh, we passed all the audits. The DCMA auditor said we had the best production quality system, the best, you know, everything. And we failed the financial audit because we had no business. So um, the whole point of that warm basing was to support us financially. And we failed that financial last audit uh, that was this past September. And so uh, we stopped production in October. Um, so with all these challenges, uh, I don't see how we've learned any lessons. And, you know, we paid the heavy price of paying $20,000 a container for ocean freight, paid 80,000 freight to flight, 25 lines over. Uh, we produced millions of masks. So, you know, we took the risk, uh, you know, but at the same time from, from the private sector, you know, we're only going to produce for what is, you know, available or demand in the market. And now that a lot of the supply chain has now subsided and gone back to traditional, um, you know, we're looking for other options to figure out how to stay viable. And so speaking on technology, I mean, you know, we've been in, innovative from the very beginning. We're the first to have a uh, material science that has, you know, antimicrobial that's interwoven, that's not, apl not applied. Um, we're still in R&D right now for a PLA bio-based mask. Um, so our roots being in Silicon Valley, you know, we're always looking to innovate and we need the freedom as a, a private business to actually, you know, meet the demands of the public, but we need support. And, um, you know, and unfortunately, um, commercially speaking, like those are all challenging things. And um, a lot of the, <laughs> even though we're all competition, you know, we, we kind of all went through the same kind of Band of Brothers issues of what, what happened throughout the last two, three years. And I, I don't think it was, uh, you know, widely uh, talked about. And so I'm, I'm happy to be able to share this for you guys. And again, I'm not trying to complain or cry about the situation, but I think uh, it's important that we learn from this for the next time. I, I couldn't agree with you more, Andy, and thank you for sharing. Uh, that experience, it's incredibly disheartening uh, to hear. And certainly there's so much to unpack in that story that you shared with us in terms of, again, you know, I turn to the panelists for ideas of what's an action step? What can we do? What can we recommend where we can start to move this initiative forward, where we can uh, as Bonnie said, get the federal agencies to work much more collaboratively. Where can we streamline some of this that streamline and eliminate some of the complexity and yet at the same time make sure that everything we're doing is supportive of that manufacturing base, recommend, recognizing that they need uh, support to be able to be there uh, in times of crisis when we need them. So um, we have a couple of minutes left, but I just ask each of our panelists to really think about an action item. How can we transform this? And another topic that we really haven't even addressed yet, the leadership for this. Where should the leadership be going forward? Um, thoughts that you may have. Sundarisen. Thank you, Tanner. I just want to pick up on what uh, uh, Mark and uh, Andy said. You know, uh, innovation. These uh, these standards have to uh, account for innovation that is coming up. That's very very critical because if we don't, uh, if the standard the standard needs to evolve with the innovation and integrate it, that's that's how the standard becomes living, and new technologies that Andy was talking about can easily make it into the mainstream, uh, and we can get it. And um, the other part of the uh, cycle is to try it back, tie it back to quality assurance so that the manufacturers, when they come up with the product, it indeed conforms to the standards it is supposed to do. So that whole cycle needs to come. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, your uh, question right now, in terms of what is the action plan, 
first and foremost, I think it is important to engage all the stakeholders, bring them to the table and say, this is the challenge. You know, that's what this workshop has done. So as a follow-up to this one, if we can bring the leaders from each of these organizations and say, we need to remove all any barriers that we have between each of us. And this is a mission that we need to accomplish. And that way, that's kind of laying the foundation for moving this forward. And then we use some kind of a prioritization met methodology to identify how we are going to do and which particular product or process, uh, uh, attributes that we're going to focus on and move the board forward. Thank I you. think it would be good, uh, Sandrisen, is that, that kind of that matrix, that spreadsheet you had is, you know, let's identify all of the critical supply chain that we need. Let's identify US manufacturers for all the respective ones. And let's identify if we can work with commercial, private, public. You, you need both. You can't just look. I, I don't anticipate to build a business to just, you know, only focus on government contracts and just live off that, right? Those are nice to have to ramp and scale when we need to. But we need to actually, you know, also compel the private sector to commit, you know, five, ten percent of their budget to American-made products, right? Uh, we can't be held to the same standards and price points of overseas. Uh, it just doesn't work like that, right? Because when you need us to call on us. Um, you know, we're one of, I think, less than 10 surgical manufacturers of N95 in, in the U.S. Um, and I would venture that, like, if you look at the NIOSH list for all of the industrial, I think there's like hundreds and hundreds of pages. For surgical, there's one page, right? And if you look at it, I think over half is private label. And I think there's less than 10 that are here in the U.S. So all the frontline workers that we needed, we have that surgical N95. We went through all of the testing. It's a very expensive process, right? And um, we, we have sold like probably tens of thousands of those masks, that's it, right? And those were needed most critically. And now that will be lost potentially here. And uh, when I looked at that list of 10 manufacturers, uh, most of those US companies are not manufacturing in the US. So if we do have any supply chain issues, I mean, you see what's going on geopolitically. If there's anything with China, Taiwan, that whole entire supply chain for PPE will be devastated again. There will be nothing else if there's sanctions or anything else. So. I'm not here to spread fear or whatever, but we have to have resiliency here. It has to be here in the US and you have to be able to use that spreadsheet to kind of help identify where those gaps are, identify where the strategic partners are and how to allocate resources for the current situation and then how we would ramp and flex up uh, during the times of when we when we need to, right? And um, I think there's a lot of ideas and innovation and you know, like I said, I don't come from PPE, I don't come from manufacturing, but as a technologist, um, I think there's a lot of creativity and outside the box thinking that we can bring to the table to help, um, you know, come to the table and, and work with all the policy regulators and, and private public partnerships to, you know, hope to avoid this. I, I think that's my biggest thing is finding a solution that, that's compelling that will avoid the same situation. Because if we go through this again for a future pandemic, I, I would, you know, it'd be, it'd be difficult for me to swallow. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, Cindy Reason. Okay, we're, we are starting to approach the end of our time, so I'm going to go to Oslam next, followed by Mark, and then we're going to have to wrap up our session. Thank you. Sure, just very quickly, just to reemphasize uh, what has been said in terms of thinking about the system and all the stakeholders in the system, the leadership should have the will to really build an incentive system as well to have the manufacturing viability, to have the manufacturing flexibility, the right levels of inventory, because somebody has to pay for all of these. And there is a need for, uh, you know, I would say regulatory and policy uh, leadership as well. Thank you, Aslam. Mark? Yeah, just really quickly to add on to leadership, as, as I think about the federal org chart, I wonder if this is on HHS leadership. So is does the deputy know uh, that this is an issue? Uh, they, they should be at the very highest levels um, dictating the coordination between the two agencies to make sure that we have standards that are one, aligned, because some agencies you know, we've got conflicting standards as an end user, it's really difficult to interpret and understand how to actually apply those standards. Um, but I think it needs to be driven from all the way at the top, this coordinating effort. And so anything, any recommendations that can come out of this workshop um, to get to that level, I, I think that's, that's, the, that's the level that is needed in order to 
help coordinate the different agencies. Thank you. Excellent point, Mark. Thank you for sharing that. Well, clearly this conversation could go, go on for much longer. And I think uh, each of us have more that we would like to contribute and some points we'd like to delve deeper into. Um, but I wanna thank everyone on the panel for this roundtable discussion, um, for sharing experiences, stories, frameworks, and your expert insight. Thank you very much for participating in this panel. And on this note, I'm going to uh, hand the session back over to Linda for our final section of the workforce. But again, my sincere gratitude to you all. <laughs>